Good morning, everyone. Uh, I think we're, oh, still a couple people straggling in. I think we're good, okay. Well, uh, good morning. Yeah, I know this is always in the 9 a.m. session, it's always the, the early morning one, so everyone's bright and, bright and ready and uh, ready to chat about machine learning, artificial intelligence, gaming, all that good stuff. Um, so before we begin talking about all this really cool products, all the uh, interesting work that we're doing here at Unity, I want to talk a little bit about you know, gaming and actually just AI research in general. There's quite a bit of intersection overlap between the two areas. Uh, my name is Jeff. I'm the lead product manager for artificial intelligence here at Unity. And I really welcome you guys today to this conversation. Um, so actually, games have been used in artificial re intelligence research, not just in the recent you know, last couple of years, but actually for a very, very long time. So board and trivia games are a really good example of this. So in 1950, if you guys are familiar with someone named Claude Shen, he publishes this paper called Programming a Computer for Playing Chess. Now this has really kicked off this whole notion of having machines usually, basically using games uh, as sort of this way to drive intelligence. Um, and it really set up chess to be sort of this modern problem to be solved by computers. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, another pioneer in the space named Arthur Samuel creates a checkers program that uses uh, what is now kind of described as heuristic search, learning-based methods. And you know, sort of this, like, you know, and it, was, it was good enough to beat some of the best amateur players in the world, but not really quite you know, some of the best professional players. In 1989, uh, this pr uh, checkers program developed by Chinook, uh, it's called Chinook, developed by uh, the Univ University of Alberta, actually beat some of the best professional players in checkers. Now, the Guinness Book of Records, I think, had this as the first computer program to beat a professional uh, player in a tournament setting. So you can see that there's like this progression of games and how it's just driving a lot of things in computer science and research. Uh, in 1992 to 2002, uh, Gerald Tussaud, who's from IBM Research, uh, publishes uh, or creates a program called TD Gammon, uh, which is used to actually new strategies about backgammon. So this is kind of interesting in that it's kind of the first time that humans use the computer program to derive new strategies on how to play a game. So prior to a lot of uh, Professor Tussaud's work, a lot of uh, you know the way humans played backgammon was really fundamentally changed by the way the computer played it. So it's kind of this like, interesting moment where a computer is sort of teaching the human how to play a certain game. In 1997, I think, uh, I'm old enough to re sort of remember this, but I remember when IBM defeated uh, Gary Kasparov in chess. Now, if you play chess or follow chess, this is a really huge moment uh, where you know, IBM Deep Blue using, you know, basically like sort of a brute force method uh, beat, you know, won a grandmaster in chess. So kind of this like, very seminal moment where a lot of people were like, huh, can computers really start to beat humans into a lot of different things? In 2011, IBM Watson defeated Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter. And actually, this, this, if, if, you guys ever, if you guys have Netflix, this, this episode of the machine playing these two is actually on there. So it's really interesting. And it uses a lot of you know, NLP, natural language processing, information retrieval, and, and this, this notion of automated reasoning. So a lot of examples in the board and trivia space really contributing to a lot of like the AI research side. Uh, and of course, in 2016, very recently, DeepMind uh, defeated uh, Lee Sedol, who was the champion in Go. Now, if any of you guys are familiar with Go, it's one of those games that can't be solved with brute force or you know, a search tree kind of problem that you can use with uh, chess. It was one of these ones that really required a very new way for a machine to play. And it, it was one of those very interesting moments very recently uh, where you know, a computer can beat the world champion in Go, which was considered unsolvable until very recently. Uh, so in the video game side, also a lot of very interesting examples. Uh, if you guys are familiar with Atari 2600 games, both DeepMind and OpenAI has published a lot of papers around you know, how to beat some of these you know, old school Atari games. Uh, Doom, which was uh, really uh, created, they created this uh, program called VizDoom, which is kind of this kind of a, a pioneering way to use games and simulators as a way to do computer vision and perception research. Uh, you have Quake 3 with Capture the Flag, a lot of like interesting multi-agent sort of research. Minecraft with Project Malmo, StarCraft II, uh, DeepMind and Blizzard collaborated, you know, Dota 2 that beat some of the top players in these games. So you're starting to see a video game is actually pushing the boundaries of, of the research field. And so just kind of very quickly, some very novel approaches in the AI space, and it's kind of relevant to kind of the work we do here at Unity, is that you know, Deep uh, uh, published a paper called DQN, which is a very, you know, very interesting approach to solving uh, and how they kind of use this for you know, some of the Go program. Uh, proximal pro policy optimization, which is you know, originally actually one of the algorithms used in a lot of gaming for reinforcement learning that we also use a lot in, in our kind of research and products. 
Um, and OpenA5, if you guys saw this on Twitch and some of these other places, that you know, they, they kind of detailed this approach of how they beat some of the top ranked uh, Dota 2 players. And of course, very recently, I think earlier this year, around January, you know, DeepMind uh, produced a program that beat some of the top StarCraft II players, which, you know, again, it's considered one of the grand challenges of AI is to, is to beat you know, StarCraft II. It's uh, you know, hundreds of actions, a lot, a lot of strategy, a lot, a lot of different ways to approach the problem. Uh, so a lot of uh, folks actually, you know, especially in the gaming audience, uh, really there's actually, Unity is actually used for a lot of AI research. If you think about some interesting problems uh, if, uh, from a gaming perspective, you know, we've made some of the biggest games, Pokemon Go, Cuphead, and a lot of like, uh, you know, we have a collaboration with DeepMind. A lot of these research institutions, uh, including academics and academia, and also, uh, you know, uh, sort of industrial in uh, research institutions are really turning to Unity for a lot of this re AI research. Um, so this is from Demis Hassabis, who's the co-founder and CEO of DeepMind. So he kind of had this you know, very interesting quote when we partnered. Says, As a former game video game designer myself, I couldn't be more excited to be collaborating with Unity, creating virtual environments for developing and testing the kind of smart and flexible algorithms we need to tackle real-world problems today. And so that's for us, is a very important sort of quote because, you know, as we have researchers solving the sort of very hard problems, you know, we can kind of bring those back in and have, uh, you know, solve some of the bigger problems in gaming. So just a, you know, uh, just a couple of kind of thoughts on like what we are doing in the AI research field before we talk to some of the things that we're doing in gaming. So of course, half of all the world's games are built with Unity, and some actually were created with AI research in mind. So there's actually two out there, and we launched uh, both with the Obstacle Tower Challenge and then one that's going on, which is called the Animal AI Olympics. Now these games were designed specifically for AI research. I mean, you can, you can play it as a player, but you may get very frustrated because these games are, are, are really hard to kind of solve uh, in, in a lot of different ways. Um, so the Obstacle Tower, we launched this in February. Uh, we over 100,000 in prizes. We had over 2,000 entries from 350 teams across the world. Uh, we announced the winners uh, uh, in August, uh, and we you know, kind of collated some of the research and some of the ways they approached to solving it. Now the Obstacle Tower is a, a highly visual, uh, you know, real th real time, you know, sort of real 3D environment. A lot of control uh, problems, a lot of planning problems, and really just trying to get in the world of generalization and how do agents actually can solve and, and beat these kind of levels. Um, there's a lot of different floors and different themes. So you know, the if you're creating a machine learning system, it has to take into account these uh, different variables. And everything's procedurally designed. Every episode, new tower, every tower, every floor, every room, new obstacles, nothing is the same. So there's no way for a machine to sort of cheat uh, trying to beat the obstacle tower. Uh, and so we have, the, these are our top winners, uh, Alex Nicole, who was actually formerly from OpenAI. Uh, the second place is a team from uh, Barcelona. And third place is uh, a gentleman from uh, South Korea. So a lot of different places, a lot of interesting approaches. And we found out that there's a lot of different techniques that you have to use to solve you know, sort of these games, uh, at, at, you know, at, with these kind of challenges. We also have the Animal AI Olympics, which is actually hosted by the Imperial College of London. Also a very interesting challenge in, uh, you know, generalization and vision, retrieval. Uh, they used it with Unity and the Unity ML Agents Toolkit. Um, and they also have about 30,000 enterprises, uh, and it's, you know, the contest is ongoing now. So just kind of some examples of how, you know, our team at Unity is also trying to drive the AI research side. So it kind of comes back to the question, like, you know, what does this all mean for game developers? Why are we investing so much in research? Is that we can actually bring a lot of these advancements in intelligence research back into Unity and really trying to help our developers solve and create new kind of behaviors in their games. And you know, we'll talk a little bit about some of the, the products we're working on, some of the you know, programs that we have going on. Uh, so if we think about behaviors in games, there's actually a lot of different components now. There's, you know, what you think about like the NPCs, uh, uh, you know, squads of NPCs, game objects, but even things like the game world, the storytelling aspects, even things like player assistance. All these have very, you know, different kind of behaviors, different kind of experiments for gamers. Um, so what we think about, there's actually different levels of behavior. And so if you think about at the very high level, there's what we consider like strategy and tactics. So if you have a squad of NPCs, they got to capture a flag, that's sort of the high level meta goal. And you have what we call like navigation. Okay, so every individual NPC has to figure out how to get to the flag. Maybe they got to go through this path, they got to get around the forest. And then, you know, of course, you know, down to the specific frame level, you know, how do they, you know, how do the joints move? How do they actually get around this rock? And so when we think about these uh, as a different level of behaviors and how do you actually like, create these kind of behaviors, um, you, know, you sort of at the top, it's, it becomes sort of a, what we call like a highly combinatorial type of problem. 
So if you think about, you know, I flew from San Francisco, I have to get in an Uber, I have to get on the plane, I have to get in my seat, the plane has to take off, I have to get to uh, grab a, I guess a taxi or a grab, come to the hotel. And then you give, go, go lower and lower, it becomes what we call like sort of a multi-dimensional non-linear problem. So things get very continuous, you know, how to like, uh, you know, all the different like animations and frames and how those can be generated uh, using machine learning or AI. Um, so when we think about the, uh, the world and sort of the game AI and also like behaviors, there's sort of like three different ways that you can solve these kind of problems. Now I think most people who are game developers or designers you know, are very familiar with this. It's what we call like the reactive AI. You write a very explicit code on how something should behave in a game. So this is your C sharp scripts, these are behavior trees, there's a lot of state machines. We also have this kind of notion we call like we call deliberative AI. So we actually focus on designing the problem instead of trying to write explicit code on how something should work. So these are things like if you're familiar with like you know Waypath uh, navigation, you know these are A stars. These are, these are your sort of planners. And of course, this is sort of my favorite. We have the machine learning AI. So now we don't we teach the machine to do stuff. And this is where we can uh, we have some you know products and tools out there around imitation learning, reinforcement learning, some of the latest. Uh, and sort of the machine learning AI and research side. Um, so as you kind of go from one side to another, you have what we consider controllable. So on one side, if you write a lot of very explicit, deliberate code, you know, you get very, a lot of control in the game and like how it should actually work. Versus when you go to the machine learning side, you're sort of letting the machine dictate how the behaviors go. Now there's, obviously there's different solutions for different scenarios, um, but here at the AI team, and also in our labs team, we're kind of focused on these, these type of problems for our game developers. So today's approach, again, what we, got, we see a lot is like, uh, there's a lot of just coding. So you're, you're with the strategy, with the tactics, with the navigation, with the animation. It's just really just code, 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 code. Um, you know, and we find out this is becoming uh, some of our, especially some of our you know, larger games, some more complex scenarios. This is starting to become a little bit challenging to try to code everything. So what we've actually kind of think about is like, you know, some places you do need to write explicit code, some places you need to use a solver, and some places where machine learning uh, is, is a really good place and a really good solution for certain kinds of behavior. So we'll talk a little today about two, uh, actually three areas that we're kind of focused on. One is what we call the AI planner, and then also we have the machine learning agents toolkit and then some of the inference engine about putting these machine learning models back into games. Uh, so the Unity Labs AI planner was actually announced at GDC, uh, excuse me, at the Unite event in Austin a couple years ago. Uh, it's part of our labs team. It's actually out in uh, preview right now. If you just search for the package uh, for 2019 and above, you should be able to find it. Uh, so what the AI planner really is focused on is it just kind of a way to describe is if you, if you know search, you know shortest path, you know motion planning, you know, this is sort of the find the best path through this maze, you know, find the, the best way to get somewhere very quickly. So when you think about search for navigation, right, it's sort of you kind of map out the problem in a graph in this way. So you start here. And okay, I want to get to my goal. And based on the graph, this is sort of like a graph kind of problem. Uh, you know, the navigational, you, know, you kind of map up the world this way. And most navigation, you know, kind of will use something like A star to find the shortest path. When we think about AI uh, search for behavior at AI planning, it's sort of set up the similar way. You have, do you define like all the possible states and sort of the cost and, you know, like uh, the state changes between each uh, traversing through the node. So if you're, for example, you're, you're a character, you start at home, you have fatigue eight, if you go straight to the goal, uh, you're just gonna die, right? Because you know, if you just go straight there, you're gonna run out of uh, exhaustion and so forth. But if it has the option to go home, and then it maybe can you know, get some rest, you know, it takes the key, opens the door, then it leaves its home and goes to the goal, it'll actually get there without, you know, without dying. So there's a similar way in which uh, uh, you set up search for navigation, you actually can set up search uh, using some sort of algorithm, some sort of search tree type of algorithm. For the same way you can do for navigation, you can do for uh, like any kind of behavior in the game. So that's really what the AI planner is really meant to, meant to solve for. Um, so just kind of a little bit of a description of the architecture. So there is the game. You have a controller, and then you have the planner that actually interacts, uh, and then you have what we call the planning domain. Um, now, there's a lot of detail on how you actually, you know, what we call like the trait-based planning domain language, how you actually set up the game. Um, at the end of this, we have a lot of resources, and if you're interested to learn more and how it can be applied to like certain kinds of game, there'll be a lot more information about that. So at the high level, again, the, the kind of notion is that you actually design the problem instead of the solution. So we never really tell 
you know, any of the characters to really do anything deliberately. We just sort of set up the problem, use some really nice type of algorithms, and you know, the, the machine and the planner usually figures it out. Um, and in this case, the, uh, you know, it, can it can react in runtime uh, situations. And of course, the, the, the what you kind of trade off for is you do a lot of the domain modeling uh, to compensate for a lot of the you know, runtime execution costs. So that's the AI planner. Now we can kind of turn our attention a little bit to uh, sort of the machine learning side. And we have you know, uh, you know, quite a bit of uh, you know, kind of like interesting use cases and kind of how it's all set up. Um, so just you know, kind of describe it a little bit. There's been a lot of advances in the machine learning side. We kind of talked about these games uh, previously. We have you know the collaboration with OpenAI and DeepMind. So a lot of these things that we actually want to try to package and put it back uh, into uh, you know for any game developer that want to use some of these advancements to solve you know sort of the low, you know sort of the any kind of problem in the game that requires a machine learning type of solution. Um, so in a lot of ways, we're really not coding anything, any of these behaviors, NPCs, or actions. We're actually just trying to teach the machines how to play these games uh, for a lot of different use cases. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So before we, before we kind of dive deep, let me just kind of set up like what is an agent. So in our world, agents are something that perform an action. So at any given moment, the environment is in a certain state. Uh, and from this state, the agents collect a bunch of observation. And from these observation, the agents can take an action according to their policy. Now, the key is this notion of a policy. You know, how the agent behave and uh, what's, you know, what it should be doing is, is determined by this policy. And that's really what you, know, is, you can look at as the machine learning model, the neural network. But that, that's kind of what we you know, ultimately want the behaviors to be driven through is this sort of policy. So just kind of a little bit of illustration. So you have all these observations. So imagine you're you know, your agent is controlling somebody who's shooting a gun. They can know the location, the velocity, rotation, camera angles, ammo count, where the enemies are. Based on the policy, it can either take a, you know, it can jump, it can shoot, it can duck, it can, you know, retreat, all kinds of different actions. And every, you know, every frame or every, you know, decision point, it just repeats this sort of process. Um, so again, machine learning agent, it's a, you know, you know, kind of what is it? It's actually an open source toolkit that we allow for training these agents. So you can basically on, go on GitHub now, download it, and you can actually create these agents uh, and embed them right directly in your game. Um, we're actually one of the top projects for deep reinforcement learning. So we actually have quite a bit of game developers, but also a lot of researchers uh, using the same open source package. So it's kind of nice that we have you know, this nice feedback loop between latest and greatest, um, and then also being able to ship that to developers. Uh, very recently, actually yesterday, we released uh, version uh, 0 0.10, and we included a new algorithm called SAC, which is called the Soft Actor Critic. Now, this, this paper actually came out pretty recently, so it's kind of like just one example of like how something in academia, a really interesting paper, a lot of people found that approach to be you know, quite, quite fascinating, how we're able to put that back into the toolkit very, uh, very quickly. And so we have a, a pretty big community of both game developers helping us make the toolkit better, but also a lot of researchers uh, contributing algorithms and, and new approaches. Um, whoops. So just kind of like a very high level, like, well, how can you use ML agents in game? So that's always kind of a question we get asked. Well, this is all interesting stuff. Um, so the first one we, call, we think about is what we call the player agent. Now, this is where you can create an agent from the, pers uh, the point of view of the player playing the game. We have a couple of examples of that at the end. So this could be used something for like game testing or game balancing. Then we have what we call like non-player agents. So these are like non-playable characters um, or, or different objects in the game. This could be for you know, creating new kinds of enemies, new kinds of companions, or even just passerby characters in the game. And the third one where we're trying to get more into is what we call the invisible agent. Now this is where the agent is actually controlling the entire scene itself or an entire uh, you know, like set of like objects. And this is where you can start to get to very interesting kind of areas where the machine can actually do content generation, uh, difficulty 2D, and of course, just like improving player engagement. So this is just kind of, you know, broadly speaking, how we think like agents can be applied in games, what we've seen from uh, other studios. Uh, so kind of just, we'll go over a little bit how ML agents uh, and our inference agent work. So first thing you have to do is obviously integrate ML agents in the game. When you download ML agents, we actually include all of this with uh, all of this as um, you know scripts uh, in all the base classes where you can extend this into your game. So we have an, a notion of academy that basically creates an internal communi external communicator and socket to Python, which is where all the machine learning stuff happens. Uh, and we have this concept of agents and brains. Now brains is what actually controls all the agents in the game. Uh, and there's different ways to set that up. You can have one brain controlling a bunch of different uh, you know same types of agents. So there's a brain that controls all these like really cute dogs. 
uh, you can have what we call multiple brains. So you have one brain controlling dogs, one brain controlling the cat, one brain controlling a bunch of mice. Now, you know, dogs have a very certain kind of behavior and goal. Cats have a very different uh, kind of behavior and goal. And then, of course, mice also, you know, trying to survive, have their different uh, goals as well. You put them all together, and you get some really interesting behaviors. And that's the, kind of the nice thing using machine learning approach. You never, you can just put them all together and see sort of what happens and tune in until you get sort of the expected result. So that's kind of integrating. So then the fun part is like, okay, now you have all this stuff integrated. You, you know, figure out where the agents are. The, the big one key is now how do you train these agents? Um, so there's really two broad ways that we, uh, and essentially this is sort of like in deep reinforcement learning um, that we provide uh, as part of the toolkit. So you have what we call reinforcement learning. So this is where agents learn through experience. A lot of, a lot of trial error, you know, things get optimal. Uh, the simulations can be greatly sped up. And what you get is sort of this like superhuman-like ability. So let me just show you a quick video of this. Now this is kind of from like a, a sort of older archives. But this is like, you know, kind of like a you know, chicken crossing the road, but, uh, oh, excuse me, like a frogger type of game. But, you know, this is where the agent is trying to collect all these boxes. Now, after one hour of training using reinforcement learning, you see that it's starting to figure out kind of how to play the game. And it's just using a bunch of pixels. So it's just, you know, it can go up and go down. And it's just using basically like, you know, all like uh, the specific pixels on the screen on where it should go. So it looks like it's, like it's pretty good. You know, it still gets hit by a car here and there. All right, so after six hours of trading, it actually figures out how to play the game. So it's just kind of running through it, you know, you know it, doesn't, it gets hit by car a little bit here, but couldn't really help it. But you know, only six hours, and it really figures out how to play this game. Now this could be applied, this is sort of from the player you know, perspective. So you know, it doesn't take a lot, lot, lot of time to, to train you know, these kind of games. And just sort of one kind of illustration of reinforcement learning. The second was what we call imitation learning. So this is actually where the agent will watch a human play through what we call demonstrations. Uh, these recorded demonstrations, uh, you, know, you need it to, to use imitation learning. It's, it's very much as watching the human. Uh, it mimics the behavior very quickly, and then you get what we call like these sort of human-like abilities. Now this is um, a, video, a demo that we showed last year with uh, using uh, it's a game called Anti-Graviator, made by a, a studio called Cybernetic Walrus. So as you can see on the left side, there's a human, and then the right side is the machine. Now it's kind of not really figuring out how to play. It just kind of crashes into the wall. But slowly but surely, actually around, around 25 seconds, uh, the machine sort of figures out how to play. Now this is somewhat simple level, but this is just to illustrate the concept. So as you can see now that like, uh, you know, after, again, not a lot of training, um, you know, this is where you can bootstrap a lot of this stuff very quickly. You know, the machine learns just by watching the human play, like how, how this game should work. So this is sort of the fully baked, after the, uh, the humans run around the track a few times. But I mean, it's, it's usually we have this and we say, okay, can you tell which one's the machine, which one's the human? And in this case, it's really hard to tell, you know, who's playing what. Um, so actually, there's actually quite a bit of drawbacks for both of these approaches. So in reinforcement learning, one of the hardest things is that, you know, trial and error takes a lot of time. Um, a good example is like, if you're a human and you put your hand on a hot stove, after about one second, you'll never do that again. Machines take a little bit of time to figure out what the optimal policy, and that's where a lot of the AI research field comes in. You know, just exploring the world using trial and error can take a long time. On the other side, imitation learning has kind of an, another kind of problem. It actually figures out what it should be doing, but it never understands the why. So even though the machine can watch me play, it can, it can mimic my behaviors, it doesn't really have an understanding of like what is the goal, what is the reward, you know, why, what is my purpose of existence. So that's kind of drawbacks on both sides. Now, if you actually combine both of them, it actually is, it becomes a very, very interesting solution. So just you use both experiences and demonstrations. So what you see on the left is if you just use purely reinforcement learning. So after about one minute, it, it's, you know, the reinforcement learning agent really can't, it still doesn't know what it's trying to do. It's just, it doesn't have it figured out the world yet. But you see on the right side, because it's watched the human play, and we also set a bunch of these goals, of like you know, what the agent should do, um, it really figures out how to play the game much quickly. Now this is an illustration of a game what we consider are what they call sparse rewards. So it's kind of one of those games where you have to do a lot of these different actions, it takes a lot of time to figure out, uh, to, to, you know, to basically you know, get to the end state. Um, and something that's we shipped very recently, this is just something we came out uh, about a month and a half ago. There were some interesting papers, some interesting research about combining these methods uh, to create more intelligent agents. 
Uh, and so all this is available in the toolkit today. Again, uh, both the reinforcement learning plus imitation learning, new algorithms, uh, all this stuff if you want to use multi-GPU training, uh, do generalization with agents, concurrent Unity you know, instances, all that stuff is included in the ML agents toolkit. You know, it's just literally as easy as downloading it, kind of spinning it up, and you can start, you can get started. And the last is what we call like the inference agent. So, okay, so we created this policy, we create all these like cool things, the agent, you know, it does what we want. So how do you actually put this in a game? How do you ship it to uh, in, in any kind of production environment? And so we have, a, uh, a few, uh, about a year or so ago, our team decided to build our own inference engine. So you, today you can run any ML agent's uh, neural network model uh, on the CPU or GPU on any Unity supported platform. Um, so really just kind of illustrate kind of why this is a really hard problem. So after you do all this training, you use reinforcement learning, you get this brain, and these brain uh, control the agents. So actually what's under the hood? It's actually a, a neural network uh, with 100,000 parameters. And when you're every frame, when you want to make a decision, you want, the pol you want the brain to tell you, the agent, what to do, it's a pretty large matrix operations, and sometimes you have to control multiple agents. There's a lot of you know, processing that has to happen. Um, and why is this really hard to break? Well, just a sample brain used by ML agents has something like 26 matrix operations. Uh, your game also needs to run physics, graphics, and other uh, subsystems in the game. And you have to maintain FPS, you have to have like hardware support, and off-the-shelf frameworks, if you look at like what Apple has with their ML kit and like you know Core ML, some of these other like pieces, um, really only support one or two platforms. Uh, they don't necessarily play very well with the graphics API, so you can't leverage you know, some of the GPUs and other of these pieces through their frameworks very easily. And of course, it requires very platform-specific workflow. So if you're building, if you want to use this approach, you want to put a model in an Apple device, trying to put it in an Android device uh, is very challenging, and you have to have a lot of you know, bindings to all different things. Uh, so that's why we kind of create the inference engine. We use, you know, all the compute shaders that are available in Unity. Uh, we use Burst Compiler and the uh, IL2 CPP compiler for, you know, performance. Basically creates you a generic platform agnostic API. Uh, it can use CPU and GPU inferencing and optimize for different platforms. And sort of my favorite, it works, if you use ML agents, you like the approach, you can just use, it, it works out of the box uh, fully functional. Uh, so this is Puffo. He's kind of our uh, like unofficial mascot at, uh, in our team. Um, so I just want to show you a quick demo. Usually I would have an iPad and kind of show this, but um, just kind of show the video. So this is just uh, an inference demo running on an Apple iPhone. We drop a bunch of dogs. So if you see that the inference piece is in, you know, less than one millisecond, still able to maintain you know 50 you know quite a bit of frames. Um, so this is actually some benchmarks that actually like Microsoft and a few others are using. So they're using sort of like our kind of Puppo demo to test, you know, could you run these models and games uh, effectively? And so again, we have quite a bit of platform support. Any, you know, not all of them are enabled today. Some of them, some of them theoretically work, but if you try to use it, it, it may crash. Um, so just want to kind of put that out there. But our aim is to basically support any platform that Unity supports, and you should be able to put these uh, models back in the game. Uh, so just kind of, kind of quick updates. Um, this is sort of from uh, like sort of post GDC time. So the, there's a couple of things that the, the Barracuda team, which is doing the inference engine, um, are updating. So the first one is around uh, GPU performance. So if you use GPU inferencing, uh, we basically uh, uh, cut the uh, performance improvement, excuse me, increase the performance improvement by half. So the time it takes to do the inferencing is cut by half uh, with some of these uh, benchmarks. Uh, less, a lot less memory allocation. So one of the big problems we have when some of the early developers trying to ship this is that, hey, this is using a lot of memory. So they've you know, done some allocation for batching, a little bit better. So you see it's gone down, the version, memo agents version 0 0.9, the benchmark has gotten down almost 10x. Or I guess say 60x, sorry, six times 10. And then of course, like the burst, if you use the burst compiler, um, again, you have to, a little bit later version of Unity, optimizes and increases the performance using CPU uh, inferencing. So you don't have to use GPU all the time, you can use CPU, and the burst compiler is meant to really help um, you know, performance of the inference engine for CPU. And of course, one of the things we always ask for is like we have AR developers or other kind of developers who want to bring uh, different kind of deep learning models into the game. So today, uh, you actually allow you to support these you know, set of five uh, you know, neural networks. Not yet, not yet supported, but on the roadmap on the, is on the other side. And if you are you know, kind of deep in the side you, and you want to try to use deep learning models in the game, if you can convert it to Onyx, which is the format 
it's kind of uh, sponsored by both Facebook, Microsoft, and a few others, uh, there's a greater chance it will work with Barracuda. And so this is just a little bit of a high level on the roadmap. Um, you know, there, it's going to be coming out in the package manager as a package. Um, we'll allow you to import any Onyx models directly in the editor. And of course, we want to optimize for mobile net, which is a big use case for AR. Uh, all of these, like the frameworks with DirectML, Apple, and a, a, a whole host of others. So that's kind of like all, you know, like kind of ML agents embedding. And so I want to kind of end with some of these use cases and some of these customers that I work with. So we kind of presented this uh, earlier this year with Jam City. So Jam City um, sort of gave us Snoopy Pop as uh, a sort of way to like, hey, how far can you get using machine learning to beat Snoopy Pop? So what we did is we take Snoopy Pop. So if you're not familiar, it's a bubble shooter. You know, there's Snoopy. It's got to, uh, you know, free up the, I forgot the bird's name. What is the bird's name? Yes. So it has to shoot all these bubbles to really make, you know, get, get, all, get them all freed up. And so we take, basically took uh, implement Imble agents. So we kind of turn this notion of bubble shoot into an observation, and then we kind of coded up the actions. And so what you get is like actually like a machine trying to beat Snoopy Pop. Now this is just two hours of training. Um, we've gotten it much, much more further away. I mean, some of their training now takes like a couple of days. Um, it just kind of goes to show that like, you know, it can be done to solve even really complex games like this, but there's actually still a lot of ways to go from a research side to get intelligent agents and machines to really beat very, you know, deep, comp you know, deep complex games so, such as Snoopy Pop, which has a lot of different pieces, a lot of different levels, everything's random. The other one I want to talk to is uh, uh, with uh, a studio called Carrie Castle. Uh, so these two guys are uh, very, they're in, these are just two guys, independent studio based out of Sweden. So they came up to us a while back and said, hey, we don't want, you know, we're just a two-man studio. We cannot code all of our NPCs uh, using by hand. We, we, we like this approach. They spent a lot of time, like, kind of, you know, getting up to date on machine learning, and they were wanting to show, ship this in the game they're coming out with next year's. So this game's called Source of Madness. It's a uh, action roguelite, you know, game. It's, you know, 2D, of course. Uh, everything is procedurally generated, all the physics, all the levels. And there's millions of procedurally generated monsters. So you see these like little tentacle monsters. None of them are saying there's, there's, there's millions of combinations that's possible with the tentacles, the types of you know, monsters they want to create. And so for them, machine learning is really the only way they can actually uh, you know, code these kind of behaviors. So I'll kind of walk you through how, how they, they thought about it, how they uh, sort of approached the problem. So why machine learning? So one is that they, they wanted the, the tentacles to sort of feel alive. So you can kind of see, oh, here, yeah. So it's kind of like chasing the, the monster. So you see, I mean, it's all machine learning control. So they wanted to sort of have this like live feeling for their NPCs. They also wanted to like introduce this notion of surprises. So sometimes the, the machines have some very interesting, you know, behaviors that come out. So they just wanted to like, you know, have that experience as part of their game. Uh, this is a little, from a little bit older, but they wanted these, these tentacles to handle new kinds of situations. So as they were developing the game, they didn't want to have to, oh, I want to introduce this new kind of obstacle. Now they have to go back and sort of recode all of their AI. They actually just wanted the machine to handle these new kind of situations. So this is just an example where they were putting a bunch of blocks, you know, seeing what the, the tentacles and the monsters can do. So the way they kind of set up their machine learning for monsters, they had observations, they can see the, 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 the agents can see the nearby environment, and it has the state of its own body. So all the chemicals, all the joints, all the positioning. And basically, the action of Kagan is actually how much force it can apply to itself, and then how much it can grab, and all the like, interesting tentacle actions. Uh, and so, you know, they added a couple of things uh, for providing reward uh, for different kinds of behavior. So they gave some rewards if the agents stay close to the ground. So you see that these you know, have a little bit of a different brain, they stay closer to the ground. And they gave a little bit of like reward for certain kinds of brains that allow it to jump. So you can see that on the right side, slight positive reward if the machine, or if the agent can jump. And so all kinds of weird, like kind of uh, scary looking monster. There's like quadrupeds, there's spiders. Um, and if you, we have a demo of the game and you know, you'll see there's tons and tons of variations of like the monster that they created. So I'll kind of just show you a video. This is just sort of like, you know, like, uh, like they kind of took some snapshots of the iterations of the training. So this is no iterations. You see that the monster is not doing much. After 10,000, it starts to kind of figure out, kind of moving around. 20,000, okay, it's getting a little bit better. 35,000. And after 100,000, 
for it. And so for them, they think by about 500,000 iterations of training is kind of where the sweet spot for them to, the, you know, they sort of tested it by hand to make sure that these uh, monsters sort of feel, look and feel the way they want. So it's not, I mean, this was like, I think, 24 hours of training. So, you know, even if they didn't get it right, they just kind of spin up for the evening, come back, and they can do a lot of iterations and experiments really fast. Um, one thing to also note is that it's not 100% machine learning control. So there are some, there are some aspects they need to write, you know, some game logic, some game loops to control, uh, like especially in this case, it's the attack of the, of the, um, of the, uh, of the monsters. So in this case, you know, machines controlling the movements, controlling all the you know, joints. But when it's ready to attack, that's just based on a script because it needs to be able to you know, kind of point at the enemy much quickly. Now, they tried to use it where everything is controlled by machine learning, but in some cases, it's just a little bit too hard of a problem machine to try to take care of both. So just something to illustrate that it doesn't always have to be 100% machine learning driven. This is a case where one part of the game is controlled by you know, script, the other one's controlled by you know, the machine learning part. Uh, so you can download a game. You can, they have a game build on Discord. You can kind of check it out. Um, you know, well, uh, there's, at the end, there will be a lot of, you know, you can, there's a QR code where you can get all this information. Uh, but yeah, so this is just you know, one of like, you know, several studios who are trying to ship. This is more for the you know, non-playable character agent. Uh, and this is the, the kind of you know, the, uh, you know, the game that they're looking to ship. So with that, I, I want to thank everyone for their time today. Again, if you want to know more information, this has all of the stuff you saw today, where you can get it, where you can download, contact information. You know, it doesn't have my home address, but it has my email if you want to contact me. Um, stuff about the game. Um, so we'd love to hear you know, more if you guys have tried it or uh, have any other questions. So I think we have about five minutes, I think, five minutes. I don't, what is? <laughs> I'll oh, change it. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll, we can hang out a little bit if you guys have questions. But again, thank you guys very much for your time.